Welcome. This is a talk about the second root of the quadratic equation. In order to follow, you need to be super comfortable with quadratic equations, as you are. Now, to warm up, we find all positive integers, x and y, positive integers, numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, which satisfy this equation. One equation with two unknowns. In school, you usually solve one equation in one unknown. You only have an x, and you have to solve the equation. Or you have two equations in two unknowns. Now, this is one equation in two unknowns, but the unknowns are integers. It will be possible to find all x and y positive integers, which satisfy this equation. Can you spot a solution? Can you find, yes? One and one. If x is equal to one and y is equal to one, the left-hand side is three, the right-hand side is three. Absolutely, this is one solution. Can you spot a second solution? Yes? Absolutely, x equals 2, y equals 1. These are solutions. When x is 2, you have 4 plus 2, 6, and then 3 times 2 times 1, again, 6. So these are solutions. Are there other solutions? Yes? Mm, we only look at positive integers, so starting at 1. Now, the w one way to think about this equation is for each value of y, for each value of y, you can look at it as an equation for x. It's a quadratic equation for x. If you try y equals 5, you will get a quadratic equation for x. If you try y equals 20, you will get a quadratic equation for x. For every single y, you have a quadratic equation in x. Now, if you plug in a random y, most likely, even if you have a solution in the real numbers, it will not be an integer because you have to compute the discriminant. And if the discriminant is not a perfect square, then when you solve the equation, you have the square root, plus or minus square root of the discriminant, you will not have solutions. But maybe for some values of y, you have solutions. Let's explore that. We make this table, y is equal to 1. When y is equal to 1, how does the equation look like, specifically when y is equal to 1? Yes? Absolutely, x squared plus 2 equals 3x. This is the kind of equation that you solve in school all the time. You bring everything to the left-hand side. Now, what are the solutions of this equation? How do you solve this equation? Don't do the whole discriminant and the whole quadratic formula, yes? Yes, but you don't even need to factorize. You can tell me the solutions right away. Yes? 1 and 2, because they multiply to 2 and they add up to 3. You know, the moment you spot two numbers whose product is, in this case, 2 and whose sum is 3, by Vieta's formulas, these will be the roots. So, yes, if you want, use the quadratic formula. You don't have to. 1 and 2. And that's what we found up there. y equals 1, and then x can be 1 or 2. Now, let's try y equals 2. When y is equal to 2, 2y two squared becomes 8 x squared plus 8 equals 12x, because it's 3 times x times 4. Bring everything to the left. Now, you will have hard time thinking of two integers with product 8 and sum equal to 12. What you do is now you can find the discriminant. Not a perfect square, not a solution. With y equals 2, you cannot have solutions for x. It's unrealistic if you try just to plug in large numbers for x and y to hope that they will match, the left side will match the right side. What you're doing now is more realistic. For each value of y, get an equation, hope that it has a solution for x. Now next, you try y equals 3. You write the equation, you compute the discriminant, not a perfect square. y equals 4, the discriminant is not a perfect square, and so on. You cannot keep doing this for every single y. Of course, you can check up to y equals 20 if you want to, but you cannot do it for every single y. I claim that these are the only solutions, only when y is equal to 1. Now, to this end, we'll analyze the equation in a more systematic fashion. Rather than plugging specific numbers, y equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, let's really look at this equation as quadratic in x. Y, think of y as a parameter. It's a letter. Y can be 
any number, any positive integer, y can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but it's an unspecified number. Now, as usual, bring everything to the left. This is an equation for x. It has a y there. If, y, if you give y a value, it becomes a normal equation as you are used to in school. Quadratic with respect to x. Now your task is find values of y so that this equation has a solution in positive integers. And what is the condition? What is, um, how would you find values of y for which the equation has a, a solution in integers? What would be the problem if you just try to plug in random values of y? Yes? There are infinitely many y's that you have to uh, go over, absolutely. But what would make it difficult for x to be a positive integer. To put it differently, how would you analyze the values of y for which this equation has a solution in positive integers? Something has to happen. There is a restriction on y, yes? Absolutely. Absolutely, the discriminant has to be a perfect square. It will necessarily be positive. Y has to be so that the discriminant is a perfect square. Let's find those values of Y for which the discriminant is a perfect square. Let's see. Well, what is the discriminant? You compute the discriminant in terms of Y. For every Y, you get a discriminant. You can write the discriminant in terms of Y, namely... What is the formula for the discriminant? All of you know this. <laughs> yes? Minus b squared minus 4ac. And what is it in this case? To the fourth? y square. Absolutely. This is the discriminant. Let's find the values of y for which this quantity is a perfect square. Now, it's very convenient. I can factor out a y square. We factor y square. Now, y square, the first factor is already a perfect square. Now, the question is, for which values of y is the second factor a perfect square? Well, it has to be that 9y square minus 8 is the square of something m square for a non-negative m. Now, let's analyze this equation for y and m. It's very convenient to rewrite the equation in this way. Bring the m square to the left, bring the 8 to the right, because now you can factor the left-hand side. How do you factor the left-hand side? Yes? Absolutely, 3y minus m times 3y plus m. Now, notice y and m are non-negative, y is positive, m is non-negative. So 3y plus m, the second factor is positive, therefore the first factor also has to be positive. What can you say? 8 is written as a product of two positive integers. Which one is the smaller of them? 3y minus m is smaller than 3y plus m. What are the possibilities? How can you possibly write 8 as the product of two positive integers? where the first one is smaller than the second. Yes? Two times four and, yes? And one times eight, absolutely. One times eight or two times four. These are the only possibilities. Now, those are the types of equations that you do in school. Two equations in two variables. In the first case, add up the equations. Six y equals nine. This doesn't work for us because y equals 3 halves doesn't count. We're not interested in 3 halves. We only look at positive integers, whole numbers. Ganze Zahlen. Second case, add them up. y has to be 1. 6y is equal to 6. y has to be 1. Therefore, the only value of y for which the discriminant is a perfect square is y equals 1. That's why on the previous slide, with y equals 1, we found solutions. With y being 2, 3, 4, and so on, we were not able to find the discriminant to be a perfect square. y equals 1 is the only possibility. Once y is equal to 1, 
we did it on the previous slide, there are two options for x, one or two. Therefore, these are all the solutions of this equation. Okay, this is our warm up. By the way, you can figure out these solutions in an easier way, but I chose this proof because uh, this is a warm up for what the talk is really about. Now, the talk is about the solutions of that equation on the top. Find all positive integers, x, y, z, so that their squares add up to three times their product. We'll be able to describe all positive integers which satisfy this equation. One equation in three variables, but the variables are positive integers. Okay, now let's start. Let's start analyzing this. Can you spot a solution? Yes? One, 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 absolutely. When x is equal to y is equal to z is equal to one, you definitely have a solution. Very nice. Can you spot another solution? Just playing with it. Yes? 2, 1, 1, absolutely. 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, these are all solutions. Because 1 square plus 1 square plus 2 square is 6 is equal to 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. These are solutions. Now, we're going to describe all the solutions of the equation. This is a complicated equation. It will have infinitely many solutions, in fact. Now, let's first, for starters, let's describe all solutions in which two of the coordinates are equal, which, has two equal, which have two equal components. So let's say y is equal to z. Find all solutions with y equals z. In this case, the equation becomes x squared plus 2y squared, because you had y squared plus z squared. It's 3 times x times y, but z is equal to y. So 3 times x times y squared. And that's the equation that we did for our warm-up. We found that the only solutions are x, y equals 1, 1, and 2, 1. y has to be 1, and x can be 1 or 2. All right, so our warm-up actually tells us something very important. If you look at this equation on the top, and if you try to find solutions which have two equal components, what can you say for about these solutions? Solutions of the equation with two numbers equal. If two of them are equal, let's say that they are y and z. By symmetry, you can assume that it's y equal to z. And when y is equal to z, then they have to be 1. The two equal numbers have to be 1. And the other number can either be 1 or 2. What is the conclusion? Yes? These are the only solutions. Absolutely, there are only these four solutions where two of the coordinates are equal. Absolutely, these, referring to these four, are all the solutions with two equal components. Absolutely. Let's call them special solutions. They will show up. They will show up later. Now, again, you want to find all solutions of this equation. Now, the question, of course, is, are there other solutions? Can you find other solutions? Now, if you try, if you just try larger values of x, y, and z, if you try x to be 5, y to be 7, z to be 20, very unlikely that the left and the right-hand sides will match. Just by guessing, you have very little chance to find solutions. Now, let's say for now you want to at least figure out another solution. Find another solution. Just by guessing, you have a very hard time. Now, here is the idea. This is a brilliant idea. The equation, the equation is quite complicated. But the equation, if you fix two of the variables, if you fix their values, how does the equation look like as an equation for the third variable? What kind of an equation is it? Yes? Not a linear, because let's say I fix the values of x and y, I fix some numbers, and I look at what remains as an equation for z. Yes? Quadratic equation, absolutely. The equation is quadratic with respect to each variable separately. If you assign values to two of the variables, 
you get the quadratic equation for the third variable. Okay? If, you, if you decide, let's say, you assign values to x and y, z, I color it in red, z will be your only variable. x and y specialize. Let's say you decide that x is 5, y is uh, 21. Then you get an equation for z, and it's a quadratic equation for z. If you want, you can think of it as a quadratic equation in x, once you specialize y and z. It's a, the equation is quadratic with respect to each variable separately. This will be the main idea. Now, let's take advantage of that. The equation is quadratic for each variable separately. How would you hunt for solutions? I ask you to find another solution. So far, we have these four solutions. Find another solution. Find the fifth solution. There will be. There will be more solutions. How will you find them? Now, let me tell you how you may try to find them, but that wouldn't really work, so we'll have to modify it. The equation is quadratic in z, once you assign values to x and y. Let's say that you assign values to x and y at random. x equals 20, y equals 78. Then you get an, an easy equation for z, just a quadratic equation of the type that you solve in school all the time. However, what would go wrong if I just plug in random values for x and y? Do I have real hope that I will get a solution for z? Yes or no? And why? What is going to happen if you plug in x to be 10 and y to be 25? What would go wrong? Would you then expect a solution for z or not? Right, one, one problem is that then you would only be able to randomly guess solutions, but that wouldn't be a systematic way to exhaust all solutions. This is nice. But even if your task right now is just to find another solution, I ask you, we have four solutions, just find a fifth solution. Yes? The chance is very low that the discriminant will be a perfect square. If I give you random values for x and y, you can try this if you want. Plug in random values for x and y, you get a quadratic equation for z. The chance that the discriminant is a perfect square is very low. It will not be a perfect square unless you are super, super, super lucky. And then you will have a solution z equals something, but that thing will involve a square root. z will not be a positive integer. Then you may try other values of x and y, and you can keep trying. You have a very hard time hitting an equation which has a discriminant perfect square. Now, rather than, that's the abstraction, rather than try random values for x and y, we agree the equation is quadratic in z. Rather than try random values for x and y, let's choose well-designed values for x and y. Carefully chosen values of x and y. What would be a good choice for x and y, values for x and y, so that once you get a quadratic equation for z, it will have an integer solution. It will have a discriminant which is a perfect square. How can I, how can I concoct appropriately chosen x and y so that once we get an equation for z, it will be a specific equation with specific numbers. It will have only z as an unknown. The discriminant is a perfect square, and you have an integer solution. Hopefully, you want to find a solution other than these four. But for now, let's just try to find values for x and y so that the equation has an integer solution. What would be a nice way to generate such examples of x and y? Yes? You can try to write down the formula for the discriminant in terms of x and y, and then hope to find some, um, some way of generating such x and y so that the discriminant is also a perfect square. But think about some cheap way to do it. If I ask you, 
Give me a specific example of an x and, an, and a y. Give me x and y so that the discriminant will be a perfect square. Just answer that question. It took you too long. The computer turned down. OK, so how would you? Yes? Excellent, excellent. The values from the warm up. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very nice. We already have examples of solutions. We already have examples of solutions. We know, for example, that when x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 1, the equation does have a solution z equal to 1. Therefore, if I plug in x equals 2 and y equals 1, I know the equation has a solution, z equals 1, because 2, 1, 1 is a solution. So what we do is, let's fix the values x equals 2, y equals 1. We already know for this, for this pair x and y, there is a solution for z. These two, x and y, 2 and 1, are not random. They're not like 20 and 25 that we were talking about before. They're carefully chosen. They already come from a solution. In green, I indicate numbers that we fix. So we fix the values 2 and 1. And in red, I indicate whatever is left as a genuine variable, the real unknown. So now we fix x equals 2, y is equal to 1. And we have a quadratic equation over there, and a quadratic equation for z. It will have a solution, z equals 1. Now, so far, putting it this way, it's not so exciting because we already know this is a solution. But why, why is that going to be useful before we even start writing down things? Can you tell me now why it will be useful to fix x equals 2, y is equal to 1? Yes? Absolutely. Quadratic equations have... Once they have a solution, very likely they will have a second solution. Absolutely, the equation is very likely to have a second solution. Excellent, excellent. So plug in 2 and 1, the equation becomes z squared plus 5, because once you plug in x equals 2, y equals 1, you get 2 squared plus 1 on the left side, and then 3 times x times y becomes 6 times z. This is your equation. If you want, you can bring everything to the left-hand side. Now, you know that z equals 1 is a solution just because 2, 1, 1 was a solution. Or you can just look at that equation and just see manifestly z equals 1 is a solution. So this has solutions, z1 equal to 1. So far, not, nothing exciting. We know that z1 equals 1 is a solution. But now, as you say, quadratic equations normally will have a second solution. Sometimes they have a double root. You know, x1 equals x, z1 equals z2 in this case. But here, what is the second solution? Yes? 5, absolutely. By the way, you don't need the quadratic formula. You just know that the product of them will be 5, or the sum of them will be 6. So you can immediately tell the other solution. Absolutely. So we found z2 equals 5. When we fix x and y to be 2 and 1, even though we knew one of the solutions, well, there will be a second solution. And therefore, 2, 1, and 5 is a solution of our equation. We managed to find another solution. Just by randomly guessing, you wouldn't have gotten to 2, 1, 5 quickly enough. If you don't believe, let's check. 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 5 squared. 4 plus 1 plus 25 is 30. It's 3 times 2 times 1 times 5. So we found another solution. Excellent. This will be the main idea. This will be the main idea. We'll do it, as you say, systematically to exhaust, to exhaust all the solutions. Now, let's just sum up what we know so far. We had these four solutions. Now, we found 2, 1, 5. Can you very quickly tell me a bunch of other solutions as well? Yes? 2, 5, 1, and so on. Absolutely, because x, y, z play a symmetric row. If you permute 2, 1, and 5, you will get total six solutions that really represent the same thing. Now, let's agree that we only keep track of solutions with x greater than or equal to y greater than or equal to z. So that it would be cheating to say that we have found 10 solutions. We really have found three solutions. It's not that these are not solutions, but we don't want to drag them with us the whole time. Once we write 5 to 1, we understand 
that 1, 2, 5, and 2, 5, 1, and so on are also solutions. So we are only going to write down solutions where the coordinates have decreasing order. Excellent. So now we have the main idea. Have the main idea, and now we can exhaust the solutions of the equation. Start with 1, 1, 1. By the way, at the beginning you also had 2, 1, 1, but just start with 1, 1, 1. Fix y equals 1, z equals 1. You get a quadratic equation for x. What is that equation? x squared plus, plus 2 equals 3 times x times 1. So 3x. Bring everything to the left-hand side. One solution is 1 and the other solution is 2. So you find from 1, 1, 1, you can go to 2, 1, 1. You already had the 2, 1, 1, but here I'm saying that you didn't even have to see the 2, 1, 1 as a solution. You can get it also from 1, 1, 1 directly. All you need is you start with 1, 1, 1, the, most, the easiest solution. Okay, now move to 2, 1, 1. What will happen if I fix y and z to be 1 and 1? I look at it as a quadratic equation in x. And I replace x equals 2 by the other root, yes? Absolutely, we go back to the 2 gets replaced by a 1. We go back to the solution that we started with, 1, 1, 1. Namely, the equation becomes again x squared plus 2 equals 3x. We get literally the same equation because we fixed two of the numbers to be 1s and the third is a variable. Now everything to the left. One root is 2, color it in red, but the other root is 1, so this brings us one level back. Not very exciting, that's because we fixed the second and third coordinates. It's more pragmatic to fix the first and second coordinate as we did before. Fix two and one. That's what we did. You get an equation for z. That's the equation. Bring everything to the left. One root will be two. One root will be one. You know that one of the roots will be one. And the other root will be five. So you discovered the solution five to one. That's what we did before. Okay, now, let's find further solutions. Yes? Absolutely, fix 5 and 2. What else can we do? Yes? Fix 5 and 1. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, that's how we're going to generate further solutions. Before we do that, let me do something that is... Mm, that looks a little bit stupid, but it will be useful. It will be useful later. Just to be sure, what happens if you fix the 2 and 1? If you fix the 2 and 1, well, that's how we got to 5 to 1, by fixing 2 and 1 before. So if I fix the 2 and 1, look at it as an equation for x. I get x squared plus 5 equals 6x. That's the equation we had before. Bring everything to the left. One root is 5 in red. The other root will be 1. So this brings us back to 2, 1, 1. Nothing interesting. You don't want to fix the middle and last coordinates. So as you propose, we should be fixing 5 and 1 or 5 and 2. This has better chance to give us new solutions. Let's fix 5 and 1, see what happens. Fix 5 and 1, it fix the values of x and z. Look at it as a quadratic equation in y. What is the equation? Let's write it down. We have to... We know, before we even write it down, we know one of the roots will be y equals 2. Root, nullstelle. y equals 2 will be one of the roots. The question is, what is the other root going to be? Then we can replace this red coordinate 2 by the other root, and this will give us another solution. But to calculate the other root, we should actually write down the equation. What is the equation when x is 5 and z is 1? Yes? Absolutely, absolutely. 5 squared plus 1 squared is 26. 3 times 5 times 1 is 15. So you get 15y. Bring everything to the left. What are the solutions of this equation? Yes? 2 and 13. Absolutely. One root, you know, it will be 2. You don't have to do the quadratic formula, compute the discriminant and all of that. You know one solution will be 2 because... Well, 5, 2, 1 was a solution of the initial equation. One root will be 2. Once you know that 2 is a root, 
the roots multiply to 26, the other root will be 13. Therefore, the 2 can be replaced by 13, and, well, therefore, 5, 13, 1 is a solution, but we agreed to write down the largest first, so 13, 5, and 1 becomes a solution. Excellent! We have found so many solutions. You proposed also to fix 5 and 2. By the way, at this point, if you want, you can keep going from 13, 5, 1, but let's be more systematic. Let's fix 5 and 2, so that from 5, 2, 1, we get everything we can possibly get. And at each step, from whatever solution we are looking at, you should get everything that you can possibly get. Now look at this, fix 5 and 2. What is the equation? Yes? Absolutely, z squared plus 29 is equal to 30z. Once you specialize to x equals 5, y equals 2, you get this specific equation for z. Bring everything to the left-hand side. One root is 1, you know. And what is the other root? Yes? 29, absolutely. So the 1 can get replaced by 29. And we found this solution as well. At any step... What is your observation about the differences if you fix the second and third versus first and second or first and third? Yes? Uh, the one in the blue value is calculated as always bigger than the previous value. Uh, you can actually prove that because you know that the two numbers you fix will be necessarily bigger. Uh, and the two numbers you fix, the squares, their sum uh, will be necessarily bigger than... Uh, Mm. So we'll prove it, we'll prove it, we'll prove it in detail. We'll prove it in detail on the last slide, yes, we'll prove it in detail. But what is the, the statement of the observation, depending on which two you fix? I, at any stage, once you find, let's say, 13, 5, and 1, or 29, 5, and 2, you have three choices of which two numbers to fix, and how to look at it as a quadratic equation. I can fix 29, 5, 29, 2, or 5, 2. What happens depending on what choice I make about the numbers we fix? Yes? Absolutely, you fix the two, they stay the same, and then the third changes, you get another solution. But does it make a difference if I fix the first and second, first and third, or second and third? Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. If we fix the second and third, we get the solution we already have. We go up. If we fix the first and second or first and third, we have, as you say, we get a bigger solution. Now, let's agree that we can order solutions depending on the largest coordinate. 2952 is a larger than 521. If the, f the largest coordinate, if it increases, then the solution, we say that it's larger. If the largest coordinate is smaller, the solution is smaller. We can compare how big solutions are. Now, okay, so if I fix 5 and 1, we go back. But you can fix, of course, 13 and 1. 13 and 1. The equation becomes, it will be an equation for y. Yes? Absolutely y squared plus 170 is equal to 3 times 39. Uh, well, 3 times 13, 39. Absolutely. Bring everything. See, the numbers get bigger. But it doesn't make it harder to, to find the second root of the equation because you always know one of the roots. What is one of the roots? One root is 5. y1 is equal to 5. The second root is very easy. What is it? N no? Yes? 34, because they add up to 39. Vieta's formulas. Absolutely. So you get this solution, 34, 13, 1. Again, by taking 13 and 1, you get an equation for y, which has a discriminant to be a perfect square. If you just try to random values for x and z and get an equation for y, the discriminant is unlikely to be a perfect square.
It's like if you want to buy a beer. If you just look at a random place, it's unlikely that there is beer. But if you go to a place which already has a beer, where you have already bought a beer, it's likely that there, if you look exactly there, you can have a second beer. Quadratic equation is like that. But the quadratic equation has only two roots. You cannot get a third or fourth. Okay, so we have this. And then you can keep going. You can build a whole structure of solutions. You agree that just by guessing, you would have never guessed 433, 29, and 5. Very unlikely. Okay, now, it turns out that by this process, we describe all the solutions. All the solutions will appear if we follow this recipe. Now, we have to prove this. This is completely not obvious. I claim that if you just keep doing this, eventually you will hit any solution. If there is a solution and you start doing this process, you will hit it sooner or later. You get to larger and larger solutions, you will hit any solution. But this is completely not obvious. We have to give a proof. Now, take a solution, A, B, C. Just a solution. You don't know anything about it. All you know is that a, b, and c solve that equation. a squared plus b squared plus c squared is equal to 3 times a times b times c. I claim that a, b, c appears somewhere in that structure that we described before. We have to prove this. It's completely not obvious. As we always do, Let's write a bigger than b bigger than c bigger than or equal to 1. If two of the a, b, c are equal, by the way, then we already know that the solution must be one of these four, one of the special solutions, remember? And they are in our structure, so we don't worry. We only worry when a is strictly bigger than b bigger than c bigger than or equal to 1. Now, how would you prove that this solution is among the solutions that we described before? Before, when we were describing solutions, our goal was to generate more and more and more solutions. So you would fix the first and second or first and third and generate larger solutions. Now your goal is to prove that this triple belongs to your structure. So now you want from here to generate smaller solutions. So you keep doing it from ABC, you want to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller solutions. Eventually, if you hit a solution which is in your structure, then by going backwards, it means that from your structure you can reach ABC. So ABC is part of what you described. That's the idea. Now, let's implement it. Fix B and C. Why am I fixing B and C? Because you observed. You said this, if you fix the middle and third, you're getting then a smaller solution when you do the process with respect to the first coordinate. Therefore, now I'm hoping to be getting smaller solutions. Now my goal is to get smaller solutions. Fix B and C. Look at the equation as quadratic in X. X is in red. I'm going to look at it as quadratic in X. What is it? The equation becomes, what is the equation going to be? It's, it should be an equation for X. Yes? 3xbc. Absolutely. Now you have the b and c. Bring everything to the left-hand side. This is your equation in x. Now, one of the roots is x1 equal to a. Because abc was a solution of the equation, so x equals a is a, is a root. Now, here is my question for you. What can you say about the other root? Before, before, this was an easy question because we had explicit equations. B and C were specific numbers. And we just had an equation and you say, oh, the other root is 13. Here, there, there are parameters. What can you say about the other root? Yes? Absolutely, they add up with A, the other root, adds up to 3BC. Excellent. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, why is this useful? It will be very useful. The two roots add up to 3BC and, okay, what do you want to say? Absolutely, absolutely. So they add up to 3BC and they multiply to B squared plus C squared by Vieta's formulas. 
That's what you know about the two roots. They interact in this way. You know about their sum and about their product. Why is this useful? What can you deduce from here about the second root? Something that was pretty obvious before on the explicit calculations, but which in general requires an explanation. What type of number is the second root? Can you have uh, the first root? Look, this is a solution in positive integers. What type of number is the second root? x2. What can you say about it? Let me ask you this way. Is it an integer? Is x2 necessarily an integer? Maybe, maybe this whole process is screwed up. Maybe you start with an integer solution in positive integers, but then when you fix b and c from a, maybe you get something like 7 over 11, which is not going to be useful for you. Is the, the other root an integer? Yes? Absolutely, because the other root is 3bc minus a. It will be an integer. The first root a is an integer, and they add up to an integer, therefore it's an integer. Absolutely, very good, very useful. Is it a positive integer? Yes? Absolutely, they multiply to a positive number, b squared plus c squared, and the first root is positive. Therefore, the second root is also positive. And therefore, the second root is a positive integer as well. From one solution with positive integers, once you replace a by the second root, you get again a solution. Again, it will be a positive integer because of these formulas. Absolutely. So from a, b, c, you get a prime b, c. Now, a prime b, c, I've written them like this, but they are not necessarily in this order. Maybe a prime gets smaller. But in any case, from a, b, c, you get to a prime b, c. Now, you order a prime b and c. You put the largest first then middle and then third. And then why don't you repeat the process? You fix the middle and third. You look at it as an equation for the first. You take the second root and you keep going. So why don't I order a prime b and c and do the same thing? I claim that a prime is less than a. That was your claim before, remember? You said that if you fix the middle and third components, and then you switch to the other root, you get a smaller root. Remember? This was your claim. Now, we're going to prove it. You're proposing a proof. We'll prove it on the last slide. Let's take it for now. Let's accept this claim for now. We'll prove it on the last slide. We claim that a prime is less than a. Now, the moment a prime is less than a, what can you say about this solution that we obtained, the new solution, versus the solution we start with, a, b, c? Yes? It is smaller. Its largest component is smaller than the largest component here. That's how we order solutions. Here, the largest component is A. Here, the largest component, well, this is less than A. B is less than A. C is less than A. The largest component is less than A, so you get a smaller solution. Smaller solution. Then again, why don't I repeat this again? Order them, fix the middle and third, replace the first by the, the other root, you get something again smaller. And you keep going. Can you go forever? Yes? Absolutely. You have to reach 1, 1, 1. Why? Yes? Mm, not convincing enough, no. You have you keep going. You keep going, yes? Yes? Mm, smallest positive integer. Now, you keep going. What are you going to... No, still not convinced? Now, yes? 
until two of them are equal. Absolutely. This claim has an assumption. The assumption in the claim is that A bigger than B bigger than C. The claim holds as long as A, B, and C are pairwise distinct, as long as A bigger than B bigger than C. Then you get another solution with a smaller coordinate. Then you get a smaller solution. You cannot keep this forever because you cannot get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller integers. The only way the process can terminate is when you hit a triple in which two of the numbers are equal. And we already classified that the only special solutions where two of the numbers are equal are 111 and 211. Therefore, eventually, you will hit you have to hit a special solution. You have to hit a solution in which two of the numbers are the same. Otherwise, as long as they are distinct, you order them, you keep the middle and last, you switch the first, and you will get a smaller solution, and you will be able to keep going. You cannot keep going forever, getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller solutions. It has to terminate. The only way it terminates is when two of the components are equal, and when two of them are equal, you must be hitting a special solution. And the special solutions are in our structure. So from ABC, by going upwards, you reach 111 or 211. Therefore, reversing the process from 111 or 211 by doing the reverse process where you enlarge the root, you will be able to hit ABC. That's why every ABC, every solution is obtained via this process that we described. Very important. But now, we will run a little bit over time, but we have to prove that claim. We have to prove. You were proposing a proof before. We have to prove that if you order A, B, and C in this way, and if you fix B and C, replace A by the other root, you get the other root is smaller than A. That's all that we have to prove. Once we prove it, then we are done. We prove it on the last slide. Again, here is the setup. Fix a solution, A, B, C. A bigger than B, bigger than C, bigger than or equal to 1. Now you fix the values of Y to be B and Z to be C. You fix B and C. And you look at it as an equation for X. This is what we had on the slide before, X squared, and then Y and Z are replaced by B and C. Y and Z are specialized to B and C, respectively. One of the roots is A, obviously, because A, B, C is a solution. And the other root, we figured out that the other root is a positive integer. That's what we had. This is a summary of the previous slide, nothing new so far. We had to prove that if A bigger than B bigger than C bigger than or equal to 1, the other root is smaller than A. That's what's left. And then this process, everything works. Now, we've been talking about quadratic equations for 45 minutes. We cannot talk about quadratic equations for so long without also drawing graphs of quadratic equations. Now, here, how does the graph look like? The graph of f of x? Yes? A parabola turned upwards, collecting water. Absolutely. So there are these three possibilities. It has a root. f of x has a root for sure. By the way, it may have a double root. We have not excluded yet the possibility that x2 is equal to x1. There are three possibilities. Either the two roots are the same. We have to rule this out. Either a is less than a prime. This would be a complete disaster for us. We have to rule this out as well. Or a prime is less than a. This is what must be taking place. That's what we want. Now we have to rule out the first and second case. Yes? No, 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 it's not easy. It's not easy. Now, however, however, let's see. Let's just see what we know about a and a prime. a and a prime are the two roots of this quadratic equation. And we have to say something about them, about a prime being less than a. How do we tell them apart? All that we know is that a is bigger than b. 
we have to use that A is bigger than B. If we didn't know an inequality for A, if we only knew that A was a root, we don't have a way to distinguish it from A prime. So we know that A is bigger than B. Now, we have to use that. Now, very important. You look at these three graphs. We have to rule out the first or second case. B is less than A. That's what we know. We have to use that B is less than A. How would you rule out the first or second case? Let me tell you, you don't want to think about A prime too much, about the other root too much. Because, because the roots of the quadratic equation are these ugly formulas, minus something plus minus square root of the discriminant. We never use this formula today, and we're not going to. The formula is ugly. You cannot prove this claim by using the formula because you don't know in the first place if a is the root given by plus or with minus the square root of the discriminant. That's the whole point. You have to be able to distinguish the two roots. Now we'll give a very elegant proof. Very elegant. All you know is that a is bigger than b. This is what will distinguish a from a prime. We'll prove that a is bigger than b B is bigger than A prime. B will be between the two roots. How can you prove that B is between the two roots? Now, I don't want to be thinking about A prime. This looks like a claim about A prime. And A prime is dangerous. I want to avoid A prime. I don't want to be thinking about A prime. How would you prove that B is between the two roots? Restating your goal in a way that it looks like a statement about B and not about A prime. I want to avoid A prime. What is it about B that if you prove it, you're done? Is there something about B? See, A is bigger than B. You want to prove that A prime is less than A and you prove it, yes? B is bigger than A prime. It would be great if you prove that B is bigger than A prime. Absolutely, then A prime will be less than B, less than A. So B should be between A and A prime. How do you prove that B is between A and A prime? Think about the graphs. We don't draw them just for fun. We draw them because they're useful. If you want to prove that B is between the two roots, there's a very elegant way to achieve that. Why don't we prove that the value at b is negative? This is a statement about b. It's not about a prime. I don't have to write down the quadratic formula for a or a prime. This is an elegant statement about b. Why don't we prove that? If we prove this, does this rule out the first case, the first picture? Absolutely, because this graph never, never goes below the x-axis. This gets ruled out. More importantly, does this rule out the, the second possibility? Yes? Absolutely, it does, because... Absolutely, because b is less than a, and in the second case, b cannot be in the middle, but if we show that f of b is negative, b will have to be in the middle. So the second case is ruled out, and therefore, it's the third place, the third case that takes place. As long as we prove the value at b is negative. Now look, this is the hard work here, to come up with this claim that f of b is negative. It's very easy, we'll prove it in three lines. But notice, notice, this statement here that we were trying to prove is complicated, it's ugly because it's about a prime and a, the two roots, and which one has the plus, which one has the minus. Now we have a claim about b. Let's prove it. Very easy. I just look at f of b. I have the formula for f of x. How do I work out f of b? Yes? Absolutely. You plug in um, b in place of x. You replace x by b. x squared becomes b squared. So you have 2b squared plus c squared minus 3b squared c. The x becomes a b. 
Now I have to prove that this is negative. A bigger than B is very important because it rules out the middle case. But we still have to use that B is bigger than C. We have to use all of these inequalities there. To use B is bigger than C, well, let's write this as less than 3B squared minus, and the last term we keep. You see, we, under, we replace the C square by B square. C square is less than B square. That's why we have this inequality, using that C is less than B. Now, this quantity, we can factor out 3B squared. In the brackets, we have 1 minus C. What can you say about 1 minus C? Yes? Always less than or equal to 0 because C is greater than or equal to 1. We used all the inequalities in the chain. We have to use them. A bigger than B rules out the middle case. B bigger than C is the reason for the first strict inequality. And C greater than or equal to 1 is the reason for the last non-strict inequality. That's what we prove. But you see, in this talk, we were juggling with quadratic equations. We never used the quadratic formula, but we used almost everything else including the graph. You have to use the graph. Vieta's formula and all of that, and we described all the solutions. This equation has these infinitely many solutions. Thank you for the attention.